If you didn't catch the last episode, uh, we are planning a mission, or rather we already have a mission in the air on the way to Jewel, which is um, one of the bigger systems in, I guess it's the Kerbal system. Well, um, there's several moons there, so we sent a bunch of probes. There's six probes in total, um, one to orbit each of the bodies there, five moons and the planet Jewel itself. Um, we're also going to do several landings on Jewel. However, the transfer from Kerbin to Jewel uh, is a, let's see here, um, checks notes, three-year transfer. So uh, they're going to be waiting for a little while. Good news is that there are no Kerbals on board. It's just robots, a bunch of drones, so they don't mind the wait. But we need to do that transfer here. You can see uh, up in the top left our Kerbal alarm clock, Kerbin to Jewel. Um, five hours and 30 minutes. So uh, that is going to need to happen pretty soon. But you'll notice right beneath that, just six days later, we have a transfer window over to Duna. Um, so we're going to plan a mission to Duna and its moon Ike. Uh, this mission is generally a lot easier. It should be a lot lower cost too. Um, so and I haven't been to Duna in this campaign yet, so we're going to send something out that way too. We'll have a couple missions in the air at once. Probably also going to send something out to Elu and something um, Eve's way as well, although that transfer window over to Eve is um, So let me pull up my stream manager here. There you go. Oh, hey, welcome to the stream. Glad to have you here. i be here. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's go ahead and plan that mission to Duna. Let's start in the VAB. And uh, once we get that mission designed and launched, we'll go ahead and fast forward to time for that transfer maneuver and plan that out too. So, for a mission to Duna, according to the Community Delta V map, we need about 6,500 Delta V. Uh, now, if you haven't played this game before, Delta V, that means uh, just basically how fast you can go. Um, change in velocity. We need 6,500 of that. Uh, you can see at a basic level, if we put, say, this lightweight probe core um, and a fuel tank beneath it, something like this, go fuel tank, engine will get some amount of Delta V. Got this. Here we have... Um, Oh, I guess this doesn't... Oh, that's a hydrogen. That is the incorrect fuel. Here we go. So you can see we have 993 meters per second of delta V. And so we need uh, a lot more than that. So this just simply will not do. And let's see. So 3,400 of that is just to get into orbit above the planet. And so over half of that is just to get into orbit. Then from there, we'll need several thousand more to transfer over to Duna and then uh, potentially try to attempt a landing. And I would like to go for a landing on Duna and Ike. I think that would be very cool. Uh, let's go about, I like to start with the, uh, the probes. Figure out how much everything is going to weigh and then, um, then work out the Delta V to actually get it to where it's going. Um, additionally, we can design this so that we can potentially refuel it once we get into orbit. That's what we did with the craft that's currently um, waiting for a transfer over to Jewel. And we refueled it once it got into orbit to make sure it has enough to make the journey. Then some. Um, but we could plan something in like that as well. Uh, let's see, let's see. So, um, for these probes, I guess we want two landers and we can switch over, if we go down to this Delta V thing here, we can change to whatever planetary body we want. Um, so let's do the Ike lander first. Ike is actually pretty big. It does take quite a bit of Delta V to land on for a moon. About 400, uh, let's see, plus 180, so yep, yeah, um, nearly 600 uh, Delta V to land on Ike uh, from an elliptical orbit around Duna. We need something with a pretty substantial amount of fuel. 
Uh, and it needs to have a pretty good thrust to weight ratio too, because again, the, the gravity on Ike is pretty intense for a moon. So we're gonna need to be able to uh, push against our speed and slow down very, very fast. <clears throat> So for crafts like these, I like to use probe cores that are really light. Um, this Probodyne Octo-2 is really, really lightweight. Um, you can see most of the other probes are a bit heavier than that. And this one has some nice functionality. It does take a while to unlock if you're in career mode, but it's worth beelining. Um, after you get the science tech, going straight for this, totally a good idea. Um, this is pretty close to a self-contained spacecraft. It can't do um, hold maneuver. That's one of the big things it can't do, but um, later on you will unlock this flyby wire, which you can slap right on top, and now it can hold to maneuver. But that's very helpful too, and this is also pretty lightweight, so um, nothing too bad there. Um, we do need to add at least a little bit of weight in the form of a reaction wheel. We also need to add some weight in the form of a tank and an engine of some kind. So, the engines that we could use here, uh, something this lightweight could in theory run on ion, uh, something like you know, xenon or argon gas. I'm not sure about the thrust to weight ratio, but it could be worth checking. Argon tank here, and then that little, this guy. Let's see what our thrust to weight ratio is around. Not even close to it. Uh, that is surprising. Okay. Oh, I uh, think maybe because we need electricity. Oh, any electricity. See what happens if I put a battery on this. That is... Okay, well... So this will not do, I suppose. This is a really pathetically weak engine that is meant to last a very long time. But around Ike, I guess that's just big of a planetary body. You can see if we go to something much smaller here, like uh, um, we have 6,000 delta V in this. So for certain uh, places, this is amazing. Um, this is actually pretty similar to our full lander that is already on the way, uh, but clearly around Ike, this simply will not do. We're gonna need a bit more power than this. I don't think, um, don't think that ion or argon will work. So uh, we could go for mono propellant, but I think liquid fuel is generally a bit better when you're wanting thrust to weight ratio. But I realized I had these large, a lot of xenon actually. Pretty nice. So, some pretty good probes with that. Um, we're not gonna do that. Hmm. We're gonna need six hundred. Not really very much, although it would be good to have some fuel left over. That's a huge by size. That might be too small. We can check. Maybe something like this is probably too wimpy. We've got a lot of delta V here. Oh, really? That's incredible. Um, okay. 43 thrust to weight ratio. That is, that's substantial. <laughs> okay. We could bring a lot more fuel. Perhaps plan on attempting multiple landings. We could go to a bunch of biomes or a bit. Good option. Maybe we uh, maybe we cram some stuff onto this, like a bunch of extra science, and just ratchet this down to something like ten percent thrust. Now our burn time is much longer, um, and our thrust to weight ratio is still almost four and a half, even with this at ten percent. So this little thing can go and go. Let's see. Put structural. Looks nice. But I guess if we're gonna do that, 
My cookies are finest, aren't they? And a Actually, don't need a cookie. Ooh, we do need more electricity though. A lot more electricity. This is not nearly. So one of the experiments I would like to do requires almost 2,000 electricity, so that is uh, why I need two of these batteries. They are fairly heavy, but they're not uh, too, too bad. They're just heavy compared to other batteries. So compared to, say, something like this fuel tank, if you scroll down to where this fuel tank is, you can see that this is... Yeah, this is even more than two... Yeah, this is more than 10 times as heavy as batteries. So that's fine. We do also want some solar panels. I like to use these electrical solar panels that rotate, or these extendable solar panels that rotate. Nice, especially if you put them at an angle. A lot of the time when this is landed, it will be able to get pretty good power flow and recharge itself. We're gonna need to recharge it a few. Are the key. Also need some land. Let's try to keep this fairly lightweight. Those are probably way overkill. We could toy with the nanos on this. It's too small. Yeah, those are too short. We need the micro. That'll work. Adjust these downward. A little bit lower. That way our engine doesn't smack into the ground. Yep. So uh, I think that's a nice little lander here. We do need to put some science on it. Figure that out. <clears throat> and it's also got to have an antenna. Probably want to put a couple of antennas. Well, that's that won't. I suppose it would make more sense for those to be pointing upwards. Oh. If they retract, they won't break. Doesn't like being retracted. Guess we move it up. Uh, <laughs> sometimes Snap can do strange things. Just grab it. Now. Hopefully that will let it. Yeah, it doesn't. Something's going on where where it doesn't like to. Put that. Put it on the side. of science. Matter boom on this. Thermometer. That is accelerated. This won't be for dunas. We don't need the atmospheric fluid spectro variant here. Uh, ooh, that's a thought. Is I could try to reorbit it and get, get one of these uh, survey scanners into a polar orbit. Good option, although these are quite heavy. Significantly affect our delta V. Not as bad as I thought, actually. Much heavier. Hmm. It's kind of kind of awkward looking, but it would it would fly. 
And I think if maybe if we swap out this teeny reaction wheel with a bigger one, probably land it fairly easily, even with that extra weight. Could it reorbit? Is the question I might have to slap more fuel under it. It's a balance back and forth. Hmm. The action wheel does take a bit off. I would worry we wouldn't be able to reorbit. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, e another 400 real. So we need at least a thousand. We would be really pushing it. We'd have to do things pretty much perfectly. Set up. I think though, something that will work is we can lower our thrust to weight ratio a bit and just ratchet the engine power up. No. We do something like any. Yeah, our thrust to weight ratio is still pretty good, about 4.6. And our burn time is really good too. I think this would be good. We can always ratchet our thrust up more if we need to, just for the sake of control. I think this should be able to land on uh, and reorbit uh, and get into a polar orbit. I pretty good. Uh, that way we could just have a survey scanner over. I honestly, for no particular reason, you know, maybe instead of a survey scanner. A relay. That sounds actually a lot more useful than a survey scanner, far away body that you don't really have a reason to visit. But some gigantic relay antenna. That's that's what I'm talking. About. These combinable. Fifteen G. We make that one symmetry here. Looks pretty good. Oh, I didn't have snap on, so they're slightly off. Okay. So, yeah, our weight is really good. We could definitely get back into orbit and we have this super powerful relay. Would be blocked sometimes, but having any kind of relay in that system is probably going to be helpful. Actually, come to think of it, Need a specific relay. So I need. Well, I do have a max center, so I need the four class four relay. Let's see. Let me double check real quick that this is a class four relay. I'm not sure what that term means. say doesn't say if the come on the Kerbal Space Program with you. So it seems as though there are several tiers of power. Looks as though huh? ah. <clears throat> so with a tier three tracking station and an HG fifty five or an RA fifteen, I should be able to maintain communication with KSB. So that is, these are two RA fifteens. So that should be more than powerful. That is good. We should definitely be able to maintain our patience then. But our little science over here, was there more science we could bring onto this? Um, science Junior is a thought, but it's pretty heavy. I would rather send this down with a lander that has some Kerbals in it, since the weight is a lot more trivial at that time, and um, a scientist could reset it and run it multiple times. Same for the uh, the Mystery Goo Containment Unit, and um, see these surface scanning arms are pretty cool. Ooh. We'll put a, a variometer on other one, but um, I guess we just need the gravioli detector. That's the only other science thing we don't have on this. Oh, we got symmetry on. 
voila. So, uh, that is mostly built. Let's put a couple lights on it. Ooh. Brighten things up so that we can see where the stuff is. This is probably a good spot. Likewise, I like to put lights on the bottom of the craft. Spotlights are great for that, so that you can see what's going on. So they are. Let's put them on the outside. Hiding inside that end. Just rotate them downwards. And just use the move. Pull them down out a little bit. You might have to mess around with it without snap on. So now, um, when we're landing, the area directly beneath us will be brightly open. That's pretty important to help make sure that you don't crash. Let's see our science. We've got plenty of power. Our thrust to weight ratio is a little low. Let's ratchet this up a bit more, maybe 35. That's probably too high. 30. A little high. Probably about right. Okay. This looks pretty good. Pretty good. We'll be able to land on Ike and do some awesome science and then get back into orbit around Ike and act as a relay. That's great. So, uh, the way that we can get this into another larger craft, um, well, it's, it can be tricky. There are a few ways to do it. Also, I'm realizing we should probably do four of these legs because of the lights arrangement. Kind of clip into that. A little heavier, but honestly, it's much more stable. Probably a good idea anyway. Got this long end. So we'll retract these. Those are nice because they don't fold up and get in the way when they retract. Not quite as long as the other one, though. And then we want to put a, uh, a decoupler. I like to use a decoupler. You can use a stack separator. Decouplers usually work a little better because there's just a bit less debris floating around. And then one of these payloads, you can pick the smallest one. The smallest one. And this doesn't actually, ha you don't actually have to do a fairing here. You can just right click and cancel the fairing. And let's see, I think we can take right click this. Um, you can turn on, if you right click on the Airstream Protective Shell, interstage nodes. And now, if we want to grab something, say another fairing, and Uh, well, you're usually you are able to put things on that. I guess it needs to be a little higher. Ah, yes. So you can see that the fairing has a certain amount of interstage nodes above it. Our craft is actually just barely too tall to stack something on top of. Um, so we would need to take some of the height out of it if we wanted to stack something on top of it. But actually, we're planning on having this um, as the top thing. Um, an alternate thing you can do in this case is a nice little solution is just to put a fairing up higher on the craft. This, and turn interstage nodes on for that one. Then we don't need these interstage nodes anymore. And now we get that same effect. It's a little heavier, um, but it does work, which is pretty nifty. That's something to keep in mind. Also, if you don't like this truss structure, you can just right click that and click truss structure. That'll turn it off. It is physics-less, so you don't need to worry about it breaking your, your stuff. Um, it's not going to that truss structure, um, and it is, uh, and even without it, this is actually quite rigid, fairly sturdy. But something that I like to do with this, because we actually do need this in this design, um, is to put a decoupler and then a docking point. Want to make sure that we do get it attached to the decoupler, so you can grab that make sure it comes off. So uh, that did not. A good way to do this that I didn't have done um, is to turn off interstage nodes once you place the decoupler. Then 
the only place that the decoupler can attach is to the decoupler. Or not the decoupler, the, the docking port. One of these things is not like the other. There we go. Okay. And now we have a docking port. Hooray. And this is actually connected to the rest of the craft. We can transfer fuel into this and into a larger craft um, as long as we just connect something to it. <laughs> so let's move this. I like to use the snap tool to get it into uh, a good position. A lot of times these docking ports come down in like a really weird spot. I really know why they don't snap to more reasonable locations. Also, what is going on with our decoupler over here? That's not centered. That would explain why our uh, docking port was acting so strange. Okay, so now everything's nice and centered. That's good. And uh, what we want to do also is to put on this a little bit of mono propellant. Yeah, let's. Afford the extra weight. Maybe we need a junior docking port. These docking ports are fairly heavy. No two. How is the weight different? I take this off. It does not affect the delta V of the craft. Okay. Well, I guess we do want that then. That's good to know. The docking port. The docking port is fine there. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is over. I think we should be good there. Um, and we want to put on this some Werner engines. These are. Well, those are actually quite heavy. You go for, uh... Those are quite heavy. Need a teeny thruster block. Let's go by Matt. Got some ion RCS thrusters. Near RCS thrusters. These seem to be our first omnidirectionals. We'll grab these and we'll make them five more. Yeah. So now we have every direction, or backward, left, right, up, down. That is exactly what we need. This way, we will be able to turn on RCS and align our docking port. Very crucial to be able to do that things. Let's see. So this, I think, is done. Um, we need to make sure to stage this correctly. So uh, this docking port would fire. This, uh, we can actually unstage this. There's no reason for it to ever open. We'll just click that fairing staged. It moves there. Fairing not staged. What it says now. This decoupler and that engine will go. After that, we will definitely decouple this docking port before we are firing this engine. Um, this docking port is, all, is just extra weight. It's dead weight on the probe, and we are going to let go of that as soon as we can. Oh, actually, we shouldn't be using a decoupler. We should be using a stack separator so that it lets go. Oh, actually, we could just use, we could just flip the decoupler over so that it stays um, oh, on the... That way, it will stay on the docking port. Let go. So we've got this upside down decoupler. You can see if we zoom into this, it's got an arrow. So the arrow shows which direction it, the explosives are facing. And uh, the other direction will uh, it will not detach from uh, that's distinct from a stack separator which detects detaches in both directions we want to turn off these interstage nodes Uh, 
Uh, oh, once again, our decoupler is not exactly aligned in the center. Put that directly over that needle. And then now we can put our decoupler centered. Oh, our uh, dock port centered. So this is much nicer now. Um, this should be able to attach that uh, docking port pretty early on. Open that fairing up sometime. Let's make sure this fairing is actually wide enough. I think it is not, uh, in fact. So we will need a bigger fairing. Get a slightly bigger one. Oh, that's more than big enough. to avoid inclination changes that are too sharp unless you're going for like a needle kind of design that can really help if you're going hypersonic um, but i don't think this launch will quite get to hypersonic so um you want this fairing to be fairly smooth and have a, a relatively slim probe awesome okay so that is though um our first probe and we can now root it to this fairing now we can just move it around by that fairing, which is very convenient. Okay, so now that that's done, um, we need to work on designing uh, the craft that is going to land on Luna. And this craft needs to be a lot more complicated. Need a, quite a bit more for that. What I want to do is actually, let's go ahead and drop a save down. And say do not plus hike mission. And then I am going to reroute that to this probe core and take off all this and just set it aside for now. All that building that we just did, that's going to just be how it is. And then now we've got this probe core that we're building with that can sit over there unbuilt now and that way it won't it won't cause any problems with our staging or our delta v calculations anything like that. So this is going to be flying independently so hope you're having a good time at the stream today thanks for stopping by this is going to be really fun i'm so excited to uh, get this mission out to uh, these two planets i've actually never been to jewel in all my time playing on playing ksp so I'm very excited to send something out there see what it's like maybe think about how i could get a lander down there um, I have been to a lot of the other systems. Um, ELU is another one I'm excited to go to. I've never been to ELU. So very hyped to finally check out these, these destinations that I, I haven't ever quite made it up to in my sandbox time. But that's science and get some stuff unlocked. Just for adventure, really. It's gonna be fun. Um, so I will say, I do want some more coffee. So uh, I am gonna grind that up. It's gonna be a little noisy. So I am gonna mute myself. Thanks for hanging out, and I will be back in a couple minutes once I get that burger. Figure this out. All the way out. Huh? And then much delta V. That up, the delta V map here. V map going. It pulled up. Okay. 
So, um, once we get into orbit around Duna, we're going to release this craft. And from there, uh, if we do everything optimally, we need 360 delta V to get into a circular orbit. And then we need 1,450 delta V to land successfully, um, which we could use some aero braking to help with. We're probably going to do that. Um, so this craft is definitely not taking back off. Um, once this lands on Duna, it is staying on Duna. That is just so much Delta V. Uh, we do not really have the fuel tanks uh, or the electrical generation necessary to try to get that off the grid. With, say, propellers or something like that. But um, in the future, we'll be able to, um, say, drop helicopters or things like that into these planets with atmospheres and float those around. That'd be really have those be solar powered. Um, so, what can we design? Has that much delta V? And an ablaterate. Hmm. So we need to have 1,450 delta V above the ablator, and then we need something that has around 400 um, below it. So, uh, once again, we're going to use a probe core. I'm going to slap on one of these fly-by wires so that we can hold to maneuver. That's the, the big thing that we want there. And um, from here, let's see. Well, we're definitely going to need a gigantic reaction wheel. Um, well, this is interesting. Multi reaction wheel. How much? Uh, <laughs> I wonder how much torque this one has. Five versus. It's the same. I wonder why, um, oh, what is, I'm not really sure what the point of this is. It seems the same as the small inline reaction wheel. Perhaps I'm missing something. Uh, regardless, you can, big reaction wheel. Think same as this. 50. Wow. Uh, we don't need that. This is more what I was thinking. Same width. It's even bigger. Ooh, it's even bigger. <laughs> I'm really excited to see this reaction wheel for other craft, but we do not need it. External reaction wheels. Oh, whoa. That's cool. Okay. Um, I don't know these existed. We but this is probably the reaction wheel that we're going to want to use, but we shouldn't put it there, otherwise our craft will look a little awkward. So. That can hold things in alignment as we re-enter. Then we need a lot of fuel and a lot of thrust to weight. So let's put a pretty big fuel tank on. Try something. These Rockham axes are too big. Let's try the FLTXs, see if we can get like a couple of these. And um, let's set this to Duna. Say at altitude, so in a vacuum. Like what kind of, um, what kind of delta V we're talking about with this weight and engine profile. I, I don't know, a cheetah. This is probably too weak. Wow, I'm surprised. That is shockingly good. What about as we get down into sea level? Still really good. Wow. Uh, let's see. Generally speaking, an acceleration potential of like two to five meters per second per second. 
Um, and we can calculate this by noting that we have 4,045 uh, delta V. And this is set for a 123 second burn. So that is 32 meters per second of speed change every second when we're burning this engine at max capacity. Um, so that is so much. Um, that is a lot more power than we, than we need. We can theoretically make this much heavier um, and it would still be able to fly as well. Um, that's pretty exciting. I thought for sure at sea level um, we would be struggling a lot more to move this thing around. I guess Duna isn't as big as I remember. That's um, so instead then, maybe, let's take these off and actually just slap one of those rocket max there. And what we can do is probably use some of this extra fuel to, uh, push, compare the size of these. This is 360 liquid fuel versus 198. So two of those is slightly bigger. That's actually probably perfect that this is smaller than, because we don't need that much. And uh, we can ratchet this thrust down quite a bit. Let's see, how's that? Is that a more reasonable delta V? For 365, that's 10. Um, we want to ratchet this down probably even for, that's maybe too far to figure out where we want this. That's actually probably about right. So um, that's pretty good. Uh, we'll leave this at about double that for maneuvers. So that's giving us about 10 meters per second of delta V change every second. Um, that should make landing pretty easy. And we've got so much fuel that uh, we should, we might actually be able to take back off, uh, <laughs> which is, kind of wild to say, but uh, I don't think we're going to try to. And additionally, I want to cram a bunch of extra weight on so I'm not sure how well that will work now. Okay, but for now, we need a few things. We need legs on this, see? Let's go to ground and we need big legs. We can't use the little legs on this. They're fairly heavy. Probably need several of them like this. Um, we need so many of these because this engine bell is quite big and we don't want, th these legs will compress pretty substantially depending on our speed. So we don't want that engine bell to smack into the ground at any speed um, higher than like one or two meters per second. So the, the more of these legs we have, the faster we'll slow down from the five or six meters per second that we're going to hit the ground at. So those are good, but they are quite heavy. You can see our Delta V is substantially affected by that. Um, we now probably barely have enough to theoretically land and relaunch, but uh, that is honestly amazing. I'm not concerned about that at all. This design is a rocket success. Uh, 12,000 is not bad. Uh, you can see we have a few million. This is with millions and millions in the air. Um, I did a bunch of missions before I started doing this on stream and earned up, you know, about, I think it was about 5 million um, doing like tourist missions everywhere. And uh, I think we could see those in the archives. Wanted to. And uh, so those tourist missions paid off big time. This is uh, the result of all of those. Hmm. Well, I want them to not look into that. I guess we need to do some main like that. That just doesn't look very good. Um, okay, well, alternately. Here. And move them down. Um, so this is less ideal, but... Uh, Something that is possible is to put this upwards here. We can, we can actually move this quite high vertically. We are allowed to clip things together pretty substantially, so we could put it here, but that would set everything on fire. Not gonna do that. 
Instead, we're going to set it so that the bell is just kind of sticking out of the ground here. Sorry, sticking out of the bottom here, maybe up there is right. Retract these. Start retracted. We can put a uh, decoupler. Um, the only thing I worry about is that um, when this uh, shroud opens up, that it might knock the legs off. We should probably do a test flight of this, just using the F12 menu. Make sure that uh, make sure that the legs won't get blown off when we open this decoupler up. But I think that should be fine. The these uh, shrouds are pretty flimsy. They break things like solar panels, but the legs are pretty sturdy, so should be fine with that clipped in. Um, the, the concern is that the shroud opens up and comes from the inside um, outwards, so it puts outwards force on these parts, which they're not really trying to withstand. But as long as we have some sort of forward momentum, I think we should be okay. Should be fine. In fact, um, we can maybe even move these up it with as low as this engine valve is. No, I mean, that's probably fine. We'll, we'll, we'll test it out. If it works and if it doesn't, we'll fit. Let's see, so then we've got our thing. Let me just check. Oh, hey. Um, oh, thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah, I didn't notice. I am I am drinking coffee. Delightful. Message. Yeah, for some reason, my, um, my stream manager isn't showing me my chat, so sorry if I don't notice them right away. I'll try to Tap back and forth and check. Actually, now that I think about it, I was just going to open it up. Just open up the stream as like a viewer on Twitch. I don't know how to do that. I find me. Am I allowed to search for me? I can. Aha. Okay, I can. so I'll meet. Uh -huh. I, need to, I definitely need to meet myself. Sorry for the feedback. Um. Yeah, so then this should work. Now I think I can see chats. Cannot stay long anyway. Well, it's good to have you here, Caden. Thanks for stopping by. Glad to see ya. Yes, that me. Uh, okay, so now I guess hopefully that will show me everything. Even though my stream manager is kind of messing up. So, so, so. We know what kind of Delta V budget we're looking for. We know we've got enough. Put on, then, a structural piece. Let's look nice and give us somewhere to attach our science to. A5. And then you can put on this beneath it. You flip it over. It's looking little uh, adapter section here, which is good. And science. Need to put, just put all the science on this. Oh, we don't need six of, it, of all the science. We've got a gravioli detector, a thermometer, fluid spectral variometer, barometer, Magnetometer. That's a seismometer. Oh. Rather seismic accelerator. We also want to attach a lot of batteries. Need a lot of electricity for this. Those can go here. We can just copy those by holding Alt and clicking. Let's see. E3000, just. And see our delta v is dropping pretty dramatically batteries are pretty heavy that's okay and uh then we want solar but probably four of these which should be enough to recharge things fairly quickly that and then we can put out satellites on here. Kind of act weird when you extend them sometimes. <laughs> yeah, very odd. They're meant more to be on the side. This. 
I guess it makes more sense. Got some antennas to help us transmit science. Now we've got plenty of power. Another thing that I was noticing that could be handy. In fact, perhaps we want to do that. It, are these capacitors? Uh, these are actually really lightweight and store a large amount of charge. If we look at, say, something like this, we would need um, 0.04 tons for 800 charge. But this capacitor offers us, um, for only 0.005 tons, 800 charge. Um, however, it takes a really long time to recharge, so you can't use it very often. But I think having one of these could be a really good idea. Just to make sure that we can actually do all of our science. And you know, we'll probably cram one onto that as well, because it's just so lightweight. It seems like a no brainer backup power sort of thing. Yeah, I hope you're doing doing well. Enjoying everything. We are definitely go making it to Duna and Ike. Gonna be fun. <clears throat> that is good coffee. Love that. Love that. Right, so then, let's see. Huh? One, three, three. I think we've got all of our needs met here, actually, for this lander. This should be able to, with this SAS unit and that weight class of only under seven tons, I mean, that's, that's pretty lightweight for a craft like this. Um, we should be able to easily maintain a retrograde orientation, which is um, against the direction we're going. That's exactly what we want, because then we're going to come down here and use some kind of big old thermal ablate. Although that's not big enough. This kind of this kind of thing. And we point that in the direction that we're um, flying, you know, 2,000, 3,000 meters per second into an atmosphere. And this will all basically catch fire and burn away as we slow down. So this sets fire instead of us, which is very helpful. Definitely will need that thermal ablator there. Um, and we want to decouple that so we can eventually use our engine to land. That cheetah engine really kicks. That's perfect for our needs. And then this should be good and we point that way. Um, now beneath this, we need yet another decoupler. Because we need to have another stage here. And this stage needs to... Oh, oh, this stage needs to be able to push us, probably with the craft above attached above it, um, this other probe, probably needs to be able to push both of these into elliptical orbit, then detach this probe, and send this uh, Luna mission into a circular orbit, a low circular orbit around you before we let go of it. Um, ideally, we would be able to burn that engine out right as we get to, um, right as we get to uh, Duna and we're getting into the atmosphere, we could let go of this bottom stage and uh, that would uh, re result in like less waste overall. Um, Ultimately, the cost of it is not really a concern at this point in the career. We've made enough money, um, and now I'm trying to spend that money to get science to unlock stuff. Um, so, yeah, because we are only halfway through the community tech tree. So we need lots and lots and lots of science at this point. Um, now, a way that something we can do here in case we have extra fuel um, could be to try to transfer it up to the top but I don't think we're going to need to do that, honestly. Uh, there isn't usually cross-feed between uh, heat shields. We can do some we can do some stuff, uh, some part clipping and things to make cross-feed happen um, with some, some fuel lines and uh, structural things like, uh, like struts, octagonal struts and medium struts and stuff. We can use the move tool to drag a fuel line through uh, one of these does work but um ultimately i don't think we're gonna need to do 
think we're gonna need to do that at all. Because we don't really care about them. So let's just slap a fuel tank under. Get another one of those Kerbidites. Just a Rocket Max. Fine. And we'll need um, maybe another Cheetah. That's about right. Check the, uh, check the Delta V map real quick. Do a little mathy man. So, looking at this Delta V map here. Um, so, once we get there, um, we can get our transfer done. Okay. Let's see how much extra Delta V we have. Uh, two, eight, six, five. It's one, four, four. Oh, okay, but that has to come in. Has to come in. So I guess we'll use that fuel, we'll use the extra fuel we have on the slander to maybe hit multiple biomes of Duna. I think that seems good. Do like a couple short hops and, and burns to land. I think uh, this engine down here is going to need to be detached, and it doesn't need to be that powerful. No, we just need um, 250 to 360. Only about 600 delta B in this stage. We've got some extra, um, but I wonder if we say did this add it on bearing stacked that other probe on top how's our delta v look after that okay so this is actually closer 198 that's not bad although notably we <laughs> could definitely put a decoupler first. See, let's put a stack separator. Okay, and we'll use the medium sized stack separator here. So this will separate from our protective shell, which is not staged, and also from this protective shell so that we don't have that um, stuck there. It'll float around in space, but that's fine. We can just uh, use the backing station to terminate it later. This seems good. Actually, you know what? Let's let's use a decoupler and just attach it. Hmm, I wonder why there are like two layers of interstate. Interesting. I wonder if it's in. Oh, um, regardless. And now turn those interstage nodes off. We've got it attached where we want it. So that's very good. And yeah, we can see 805 meters per second of delta V with all this attached in this bottom stage. So we should be able to easily circularize, detach this probe, and then, or sorry, um, not easily circularize, easily get into an elliptical orbit, detach this probe, and then circularize. Um, and excellent we might even be able to give our in fact i think we probably should give our probe a little kick um in the right direction because i think we have plenty of fuel. Yeah. we'll do that when we get there i think this should be good so now we want uh a decoupler a pretty big decoupler here engine bell so, in fact, we probably should use a bigger decoupler here, too. Same reason. Pretty big engine. Big. One. There we go. Um, and this way we'll have that. We can do... We're going to need a pretty big payload fairing for this. Because we've got this big old thermal ablator here that we need to fit our fairing around. 
don't need to make this one quite the maximum. But just barely bigger than me. Lightly angle it up. Connect it to the Okay, yes. Voila. It seems the profile of this, this one up top is actually a bit larger, um, which is surprising. I guess it does have those two satellites in it. Those big relays pointing outwards are even wider than this. But that's fine. Uh, that will make it a little easier to turn. We've got... That's fairly lightweight, so it won't, um, it won't cause us to be top-heavy. Most of our weight is in this middle stage right now. That's great. Now, um, let's see here. Now we need to start thinking about how do we actually get that transfer over to Duna. Because um, we've got our lander for Duna. We've got our lander for Ike. Oh, something that I didn't do. I guess could be a good idea here is to slap a couple Verners on our Duna lander. Just to really help make sure that we have... Uh, full control on re-entry into the atmosphere, and we can keep that ablator pointed the way that we want it to. This is crucial because uh, the when you're doing a re-entry like this at high speeds, it's going to fight you. It wants to flip around. Um, so you need a very powerful SAS wheel. Often you need powerful RCS too, depending on how top-heavy your craft is so uh, and how fast you're going. If you're going really, really fast, um, it's it's that if you deviate off a prograde even a degree or two it can cause your whole flat craft to start tumbling and that basically just sets everything on fire and apart. But you can't be having that you need as m you need lots of control and these burner engines plus this SAS unit give us also if we run out of electricity the burner engines give us a control surface uh, that isn't electrical it relies on our liquid fuel here which we have plenty of Okay, so then, I think this is pretty good for our stages. Let's reroute it down to here, drag it upwards, think about getting this into space. Now this is a 22 ton payload. This is actually not very large as far as payloads go. It's a pretty small payload here. Um, but did a good job about keeping the weight down and uh, making things nice as, and sleek. Um, so we should be able to launch this pretty easily and get the Delta V requirements that we need. Now, um, as I was saying before, uh, we do need, let's see, we need about 3,400 to get into orbit around Kerbin. We need another 930 to get the right kind of elliptical orbit. And then from there, we need about another 140 to get our transfer over to Duna. Um, so we're looking at this bottom stage here, needing about 4,500 units of Delta V to get us there. Um, and then from there, that's when this top stage stuff kicks in. So, um, how are we going to do that? Well, let's figure out the first 3,600 or 3,400-ish units of Delta V. Um, we got to figure out how we're going to get into orbit. If we can get into orbit, we can refuel. So from there, we are smooth sailing. So what I'm thinking is that we put a huge tank under this, maybe two of them in the big old mammoth engine, and we try to do a refueling um, in orbit, just like we did with fuel. This can save us a lot of weight and a lot of money overall. We will need to launch a second craft to go up and intercept with this one. So. In fact, we could probably just use the same craft that we that we <laughs> intercepted for our dual mission. That fuel tanker worked great. I believe it is still be orbiting and will crash into the Earth here in a couple days. Or I guess crash into Kerbin. Now, to keep this structurally sound, we need to use these uh, these structural stack adapters. We know there's a bunch of them that got added, so I'll have to go through these and find the one that is the right size. Um, because we're going bigger than this. Yeah, we need the next size up. Is that this? Oh. 
Also not that. We have a bigger one. Octo girder. Hmm. What is it? What? I don't know what this is. I'll have to look into what, what these do. Oh, I see. What's the adapter? Hmm. Oh yeah, I'm not seeing a big structural adapter. I need the, um... I think it's 2.5 meter. Is that right? Oh no, it's not 2.5. 1.75. 1.875. I couldn't get the um the scaling mods to work on my Mac. Fortunately, uh, it's just gonna look a little awkward. Okay, so what we want to do is go down, grab these gigantic fuel tanks. This is huge. We can do. We might only you know we need one on it. Oh, that's not even... Got a bigger fuel tank. Pretty sure. This, I guess this is the largest internal volume individual tank. But isn't this... He's different somehow. These are the same. Okay. They just look a little different. Okay, this is the one. Yeah. Big old wide tank. I haven't un uh, unlocked the double version of this, but there is a double version of this we'll get later on. For now, we'll just stack two of them. Uh, and so this is the mammoth. You can see it is powerful. Set up. Dragged into its own stage here. You can see, oh, by itself, it is almost all of the Delta V we need. So that is just the sheer power of this mammoth engine. You can see even with all that weight above it, it has still got an 11.48 thrust to weight ratio. Although that is at Duna. Let's see. Let's see about Irvin. Okay, only about 3.24. But to take off successfully, you really only need about um, a 1.5. That's that's pretty ideal for um, takeoff from Irvin's surface. So this is really good, and notably, it works even better in a vacuum. So if we can lift this up, we can get a couple extra hundred delta V just by lifting it higher, away from sea level. So, um, to lift this, though, let's see. We probably want to put on some solid boosters. And let's also put on one of those giant, um, those giant reaction wheels. So, that one for now. Um, just to give us full control, we don't want to, uh, any trouble maneuvering this thing around. They're kind of huge. That's a big thing. Werner engines really help with these too. Something like that. Uh, that way we have nice control over the orientation of everything. And then um, also be good to slap a probe core on this. So do like a structural thing. A small girder here. And this will help you get a scale for how big this piece actually is. You can put that there. Remember that probe core we used at the beginning. Here it is again. <laughs> it is quite small by comparison to the parts that we're working with here. So that is our probe core. This is going to steer um, this back down towards uh, whatever planetary body it uh, refuels stuff at. Um, so for us, that means it's going to take things down to Kerbin. Looks as though it's actually angled slightly, which is fine. Let's just hit this with a, an angle snap just to make it correctly. Okay, I guess this uh, is just slightly sloped inwards. Ah, okay. That makes sense. Cool. Little thing there. And just for good measure, let's slap on a flyby wire here. Make sure that. Do maneuver nodes with this if we need to. That's looking fairly good. It's steerable. It's got a lot of fuel. Let's put a solar panel on it. Couple. I don't know 
how much fuel, how much power this uh, this thing actually requires. Put a couple batteries. And since this is all under our fairing up here, we don't actually need to worry too much about the arrow forces that would normally break a lot of this. So I guess we could scooch it inward a little bit just for good measure. Let's take things off, snap. I grab. I can just, it'll let me grab just that one. I had it for a sec. That's not it. Oh, that's not going to let me do it. I guess if I take this off, then I should be able to grab it. Just give it a little scooch. Go. Just make sure things don't break um, from arrow forces or heating, that kind of thing. We're gonna eventually crash this into the planet, so we don't really care about parachutes or anything like that. Just want it able to turn around and land. And for that, we need a little bit of power. Power generation. Okay, so I think that is all set. It can deorbit and uh, set us up for our orbital transfer at periapsis. So now we need to get this up into orbit uh, and so that we can use most of the fuel in this to try to rendezvous. So let's take couplers and probably want radials and let's maybe do four thoroughbreds. Should be more than enough. To get us about halfway into orbit. Uh, these thoroughbreds here are quite good. And these are solid rocket boosters, so they're, compared to our liquid fuel boosters, they're much cheaper, but they always act, uh, operate at whatever throttle uh, limit we set them to here, and they cannot be shut down once started. So these are tricky to use, right? Uh, if, you, if you plan very carefully, you can use them for interplanetary transfers, um, but you... Once you start them, you can't stop them, so they have to have pretty much exactly the right amount of delta V, or you have to be able to let go of them um, individually at the right amount, which which can take some, some practice. Um, the booster have an antenna. Ah, uh, so it, the this probe core, the Octo here, um, it, it does have a very wimpy antenna in it, um, but we have a tier three. Uh, tracking station, and this is going to deorbit around Kerbin. Uh, so the antenna is more than powerful enough to connect with our relays that we have orbiting the planet. Um, oh, if you haven't if you haven't seen before, um, I'll show you when we get it into orbit. I have um, some relays set up in a nice triangle around Kerbin uh, to provide good satellite coverage uh, everywhere. So if we're in a low orbit, we're going to be below those probes, and there's always going to be one above us to make sure we have good connection. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate the thought. Yeah, it's always good to have people looking out. Uh, it's so easy to forget something like a satellite. Um, but yes, the uh, these things here, let me double check actually, now that you mention it, and make sure we do actually have antennas on these. Yes, okay, we've got antennas, we've got power generation. Uh, that is, that's an important thing to double check. So, yeah, I don't, don't mind that. Um, let's just keep these extended because they, they act weird. Back them. Okay. Um, so, something that I want to do is, uh, I want to test this. 575, oh, we don't have this stage correct. Oh. Um, so this is still not quite enough delta V, actually, to get us up into, uh, orbit and leave us with some maneuvering room. Um, how about six of these? That might work. Oh, that's a little better. This should be enough to get us into orbit, but we don't have much wiggle room. I don't like that. I don't like that. Uh, okay. Oh, right. You know what I was doing before? I actually had, um, oops. Had a, uh, another fuel tank 
it's I think for the other one doing this. I had three fuel tanks. Yeah. That was how I was getting this to work. Uh, yeah, that does give us some more wiggle room. EWR is pretty good. Let's see, so my thought is, if I then... Where are our radial people? Match these. Should get some extra Delta V. Oh, that's not right. So, this is where these detach, and you can see... Yeah, when these detach, there will still be a little bit more Delta V left in this middle tank that we could theoretically use to maneuver around. But it's still... I would rather have some more fuel here. So let's see. Let's put some aerodynamic stuff on this, and maybe we do an extra layer of boosters just to really thump this up into space. Got some shells here. We're going to need to do struts. Otherwise, it's going to wobble itself apart. I like to use symmetry to do struts and do a nice hexagon or square or whatever, whatever symmetry pattern you have going on. And always make sure you strut from the thing that you're detaching so that you don't have any like draggy components stuck on what it detached from. So when these detach, uh, these little strut points will disappear, uh, but these little strut points on the rocket itself, those will stay. See. Additionally, uh, I like to have these engines here called separatrons. Yeah, these guys. And what these are good for is pulling rockets down and away from your craft. So we send them angled like that, and that will put some force outwards as well as the downwards on these, these boosters. So when we detach them, they'll go out and away. Uh, and we don't have to worry about them smacking into us or something. So if you've ever had some problems with your boosters smacking into your rockets as you detach them, this is the solution for you. Give that a shot. All right, thanks, Caden. Appreciate having you here. So good to see you again. Thanks for the thanks for the best wishes. I, I bet it'll go well. Yeah, you can catch the bots. I'm going to be uploading and editing stuff and putting it on YouTube. Um, I'm still working on getting a, a smooth workflow there, but I've been working through some of the recent VODs. Uh, and I'm really excited to be able to, you know, post it up on YouTube and other places. So you'll be able to find that. You want to check out what happens later on. Um, we are looking for a wing strike. There we go. These are perfect tail fins. Um, I don't know what it is about these, but they just make such good tail fins for uh, your rockets in this initial stage here. I <laughs> toyed around with tail fins a lot, and something about these just works real nice. Just works. Um, so then, let's do another set of radial decouplers here, and maybe a smaller set of boosters. Perhaps some Pollux's would be an option that we can have fire at first. Yeah, these guys. So these are a bit taller, um, but they're not quite as strong. burn for a while though which is nice not attached for let's put on a little better there we go put on there a little offset we'll drag these down and we want to make sure to bring these wing strikes in a little bit so they're not clipping um, and make sure to go to local for this kind of adjustment so that you can pull it inwards to the part it's attached to instead of just moving it left right forward and backwards relative to the actual building. <clears throat> okay, uh, ooh. So we definitely don't want to have these decouplers all the way at the top. If you if you do this, what will happen is uh, it will only apply force at the top of the booster, and um, it will sort of jackknife outwards, which can cause a little bit too much of that down and away motion <laughs> and force things to smack into our rocket. So it's a little better overall have these decouplers just slightly above the middle of the rocket. So we can see where the middle is um, there. We want this just a little bit above that. Um, that way it'll apply a little bit of that um, force to the top more than to the bottom. Um, and it'll tilt it outwards naturally. And then we're going to put some of those um, nose cones on it to get uh, 
That's not the right size. This one. And some more separatrons. We'll pull things down and away and make sure that we don't have any issues during flight. We want to make sure. Let's get far away from where we are. So, it's on the very outside, and we'll press the D key to flip them or rotate them like that. Press that twice, and it spins them around. And then we want to put struts on. We can't forget the struts, very important. Again, we'll just do a nice hexagon pattern here at the top and at the bottom. Hold things all together. Make sure there's no wobbles. This is probably overkill, but struts aren't very heavy and will have an abundance of delta. I haven't actually done the math yet. Probably do. Let's see, so where are these? That's those. Okay, so this is everything all together. Um, and then we have, where's our other radio? That's these. These should decouple first, I think. Yeah, and then these decouple. Do these burn for longer? Uh, interesting, so maybe this. is confusing. Um, so in theory, these polluxes should burn for less time than the thoroughbreds, unless I'm mistaken. Check this. Um, thoroughbred, it drains a hundred per second. 100.4 per second. Let's we do the math here on how long this burn time is. And it's got 8,000. So we've got 8,000 divided by 100.5. So that gives us an 80 second burn. Let's get these, these uh, bollocks. It is 5,800 divided by 78.6. That gives us a 73 second burn. Yeah, we should be getting a, a slightly longer burn out of um, out of our thoroughbreds, but it's not seeming to recognize that. It's not calculating that in. So our thrust to weight ratio is really good. And our delta V is pretty high. I kind of want to just put another fuel tank in. Oh. Like, uh, set this, whoops, that's not what I meant to do. Copy paste at that on accident. I meant to uh, attach it. Up this. There we go. And we lift it. Okay, so this actually is substantially more. Uh, okay, so now, now our mammoth will burn for longer than our um, boosters. So when we detach them, there will still be 1,500 left. If we do the math here, 2844 plus 421 plus 1580. That is 4845. All right, so that is, is that delta V. I think we're just over how much delta V we need, actually. Yeah, we only needed a 4500. Um, so we should have enough delta V to get up and do our orbital transfer. Um, but just for good measure, I want to send up a refueler. to potentially rendezvous with in case we find that we can't actually do the orbital maneuver that we want to do. But in theory, we should have plenty of excess. I guess a few hundred of excess, which is not that much of excess. But we don't really need to send up a very big refueler um, because we've got enough Delta V to do the other uh, operations once we actually get to the Duna system. So this just needs to be able to do that burn to get us there, which I think will require a re but not very, not a very big one. Um, okay, so we're clocking in just under 300k here for this mission. That is pennies for the amount of science that we're going to get. 
um, costs practically nothing to do this mission, um, even with these huge fuel tanks and a mammoth strapped underneath of it. Um, you know, this is so cheap that I'm fine just crashing this mammoth back into the earth. Um, that's how cheap this science is. So, um, very exciting. We do need to get a bunch of launch stabilizers on this. Let's see, and we probably need some more of these verners around the middle, um, in all honesty, somewhere around here, just to make sure we can maintain... Oh, um, I want these four-way. Just to make sure we can actually maintain good control. Lots of control surfaces there. We want more of these wing strakes down here as well on the outside. This will help drag the back of the craft backwards, uh, which is so nice when you're trying to launch a rocket. Um, you can think of these like fletchings on an arrow. Help it go straight. Um, very similarly, spins drag us nice and straight. Let's see, so then we also, we are gonna want to, I missed a strut here. Need to make sure to strut inwards. So, make sure that things are nice and stable um, in and out as well as around. That's good. That's looking pretty nice. Let's see. And then for good measure, let's run some struts from the top of this. I oh, don't need nearly that many. Three. On six. Oh, I see. I keep going over that. We'll copy whatever symmetry you go over with your mouse, so be careful not to um, cover over something with symmetry that you don't want to copy. But um, we can go, say, like that. Just right up to the outside of this fairing. And that way, things will hold a little bit more stable. You don't need to worry quite as much about wobble on takeoff. Good. Okay, so we've got boosters, then liquid fuel to orbit and transfer. We can refuel in orbit with this docking port. Good. Okay, and potentially, um, I guess we could bring enough fuel in theory to leave this tanker in orbit above Duna. Um, it might be nice to have some fuel just floating in orbit above the planet. It usually is a useful thing, um, say for rescue missions or something like that, just to have a little fuel chill in there. Um, but that's kind of a good point, is we might get rescue missions at Duna. Could be good to have a, uh, a little craft with a docking port that um, could fly over and grab things. Let's see, so... Ike lander, Duna lander... Launcher. I think we're good. Just need to cry. Much of these. I think six is probably not enough. This is a pretty heavy rocket. Put on. Put our boosters up. Should be good. Okay, so I do want to um, go ahead and test this in orbit. Um, so before we worry about staging, um, I'm going to just uh, use the, the debugging menu to pop this up into orbit and um, test things, just see if it works. Um, we'll come back down and do the launch um, properly. If, uh, if things go well, I'm not going to like do the, the launch from there. I just want to make sure that we aren't going to run into any random critical design errors when we're like three years into the campaign, um, or sorry, three years into the career. Finally arriving at Duna. Yeah, let's let's uh, pop this up into orbit, do a little test detachment, and sort of um, extend all of our um, we can extend all our solar panels and that sort of thing. Just make sure everything goes smoothly. What's this updated a version available? Well, um, we can turn on RCS and SAS. Throttle up. Oh, um, wait, we're not actually launching, so we'll hit Alt F12 uh, and go to, I think it's Sheets, Set Orbit. And we're just going to go up into Corbin and let's pick like, I don't know, 5 million. Right, so we're going to be really far from Corbin, um, orbiting it. We can see if we hop out into this, we're about 5 million. 
away. Um, and we can just attach everything. So let's see. Um, we can start by popping this and just letting go of those. I'm not too worried about testing that portion of things, so we'll send those off. Um, we will just be able to revert this, so we're not going to randomly nuke one of our craft floating somewhere out in space. Don't worry about that. Um, we're still able to revert here. Um, and then let's pop these fairings. Just make sure that works fine. If we pop this bottom fairing, it looks like everything survives, which is good. We want to make sure of that. And then we can... Let's see, I think... Do a detachment down here. Make sure our legs on this don't break. We detach. Okay, good, yes. So because of the way that we have this set up... Oh, I think our legs did break off. Uh, oh no, they didn't. Okay, yes. So then we want to... We wouldn't have to... They wouldn't have broken off from this. Empty cup where... Oh, there it is. Um, okay, so we can detach this. That works, okay. And then now we're on our ablator stage, and this is the stage that I'm worried will break the legs here, so let's test that. And pop this fairing too. Okay. And uh, let's pop this ablator. Okay, so does this break the legs of our craft? It does not. Okay, good. I, I was hoping some of these shrouds come off in two parts and go outwards, and some of the shrouds do not. Some of the shrouds just go straight backwards. Um, so I'm noticing uh, that, yeah, this is, it stays attached there. That's probably why, that's good. Okay, so this is a good design. And then let's just test this last attachment here. Um, that one. Okay. Seems like it's all working nicely. We should be able to detach that. Yep, okay, so let's revert this flight. Everything seems to be working great. Um, so let's go back to the VAB, and we're going to um, build that refuel, that refueler um, that we will need for this. Things like seems like it's working great. We're gonna be able to go to Duna with this crap. That's so exciting. Hope you're having a good time. Thanks for hanging out. Glad to have you here. Let's see. So, I guess actually, before we move on to do our refueling craft, let's fix this staging because a lot of this staging is wrong. We do want to launch these at first, and then we'll detach this and that. Now, the fairing is we're going to want the fairing to go. Uh, probably as a big clamshell with a bunch of sides. So I think like five would probably be ideal. And very low ejection force. We don't want to send this careening away. We've got some fragile stuff here. We don't want to break. We're just going to pop that off as a big clamshell. Um, this one, on the other hand, we're going to do an another clamshell, four-sided clamshell. We give this substantial ejection force, and we're going to pop that off first. So we want to make sure that that flies away. So let's find that. That's this fairing here. There's both of our fairings, and we want to make sure that uh, this top fairing goes first, as it's going to be more powerful. And we want to make sure that the top fairing doesn't smack into the craft below it. Pop that. Then we'll pop the next fairing much more slowly to not break this antenna specifically and our, battle, and our uh, solar panels. Um, at that point, we'll fly around a bunch, um, do a rendezvous in orbit, and refuel. Make sure that we've got enough to transfer over to um, Duna. Uh, at that point, we'll make a decision on whether we want to deorbit this big tanker or leave it in orbit of Duna, um, just for good measure. I'm going to put some docking ports on it um, in case we wind up deciding we do want to keep it in orbit of uh, Duna. We'll need some docking ports for it to actually be useful as a station. We'll put a couple of these normal docking ports and a couple of these docking port juniors, just because we don't know what we're actually going to come across. That should be good. Uh, 
Now, when we detach these, let's see, we need those separatrons on the right stages. So that's which one is this? Okay, yeah, separatrons with the X with the outer ring here, and then we need another stage of separatrons on the inner ring. Okay. So when this detaches, we need the engine above it to fire two. So that, join those two things together. And same thing here, when this detaches, we need the engine above it to fire. That one. Oh, so now we've got these two grouped. Uh, so that's this stage. Uh, and then we've got this decoupler here, which I'm really not sure where to put. Um, yeah, I think this will detach later. Uh, and... This will be a pretty early detachment. We'll detach this as soon as we refuel. That will be the first decoupler to go. That will get rid of um, the docking port attached to this probe and save us a bunch of weight. Then we'll separate off the top parts, separate off that for re-entry. This. I may have my decouplers Decoupler on the top, and then this engine and the decoupler beneath it. And then this engine. Oh, wait. Uh, right. Yeah, we we have this interstage here. Let me think about this. So we would be flying around on this and then would eventually attach it. And then, yeah, then we need to have our ablator stage. So we don't want to start the engine when we run this decoupler. We want to start the engine when we run this decoupler. That would have been a bad mistake. Could have ru absolutely ruined our landing on Duna, blowing up the ablator instead of letting us utilize it and then drop it. So glad that got caught. All right, and then we have this to detach the whole top manifold. Got this teeny decoupler and an engine there. Attach that, I think. That is good staging. Okay, so this should easily be able to get into orbit uh, and then meet up with a tanker to refuel and go off towards Luna. So let's take a look at what that fuel tanker is going to look like. Um, the one that I used to refuel um, for our jewel mission should be substantial or should be good enough. Um, so let's go ahead and get that into an orbit. Let's see. I forget what I named it. Let's see, um, these refueling craft jewel. There we go. Um, so this is what I used to uh, do our refueling mission for jewel. I think this should work just fine. A little expensive, but um, it can give us uh, enough to make sure that it actually uh make connection happen um oh there we go so yes there you can see now we've got a docking port in here protected by a fairing uh, this fairing is really important for a craft like this to make sure that um this is not exposed to air because it creates tons of drag uh, if you expose it to the air also you'll notice these verner engines facing forwards and backwards that's to make docking a breeze so this will be the craft that we're actually doing the docking with and the other crafts will be station. So, uh, let's go ahead and launch this up. We'll get this into orbit and um, then we can launch the other craft into orbit. Uh, at that point, we'll probably leave those floating there in similar orbits for a little while and plan our Kerbin to Jewel maneuver.